let's talk about intelligence. So what is intelligence? What does it mean? If you ask multiple people across the world what they think of when they think of a smart person, and you will probably get different answers. You might think of someone who gets good grades in school, or someone who excels in running their business, or someone who's extremely creative. Defining intelligence is extremely difficult because there's no direct way to measure it. The best definition we've come up with so far is that intelligence is the ability to solve problems and adapt and learn from experiences. But this definition doesn't satisfy everyone, and there has been no shortage of ways that researchers have gone about trying to conceptualize and measure intelligence. In 1904, the French Ministry of Education asked psychologist Alfred Binet to come up with a way of determining which children would not benefit from typical school instruction. Binet came up with a test that consisted of 30 items ranging from the ability to touch one's nose when asked to the ability to draw designs from memory or define abstract concepts. The question analyzed individuals' responses from the areas of fluid reasoning, general knowledge, quantitative reasoning, visual-spatial reasoning, and working memory. After testing lots of people, he then compared the person's performance with the result of others of the same age. Let's say that the person who took the test got a score that was typical of your average 12-year-old. That would make their mental age 12. But let's say that the child is actually only 10 years old. 12 divided by 10 times 100 equals 120. So this child would have an intelligence quotient, an IQ, of 120. By contrast, let's say a child, a 10-year-old child takes the test and scores only as well as an average 8-year-old. Eight, eight, 8 divided by 10 times 100 equals 80, so this child would have an intelligence quotient of 80. By the way, this is also why the average IQ score is always 100 and will always be 100. It will be, by definition, the average score of a person that age. After giving this test to thousands and thousands of people, researchers have found that the scores form what is called a normal distribution. The distribution of IQ scores approximates what is called a normal curve, sometimes called a bell curve because it's shaped like a bell. Most of the population falls in the middle range of scores. Note that the extremely high and extremely low scores are very rare. Slightly more than two-thirds of the scores fall between 85 and 115. Only about 1 in 50 individuals has an IQ higher than 130 or low, uh, um, sorry, and only about 1 in 50 individuals has an IQ lower than 70. People in those extremely high or low ends of the distribution typically need specialized education, such as additional help and instruction on the low end, and more advanced and challenging instruction on the high end. The other most widely used intelligence tests are the Weschler tests, which are similar to the Stanford Binet, but they have separate tests that are specially geared towards either adults, older children and adolescents, and young children. The other difference is that in addition to giving you one overall IQ score, these scales also provide you with composite scores in the areas of verbal comprehension, working memory, processing speed, fluid reasoning, and visual spatial. This is nice because it allows the examiner to quickly see whether the individual is strong or weak in different areas of intelligence. For example, my overall score was above average, but I apparently have terrible auditory processing skills. This is helpful information because it helped me to know that I really should ask for instructions or directions in writing. Just because you told me something doesn't mean I heard all of it. Scores on intelligence tests should be interpreted and used with caution. These tests are useful tools, but like any tool, they can be used for good or for harm. You have to remember that there are other factors that contribute to school and job success more than intelligence, such as motivation and social skills. You also want to avoid generating false expectations based on a single number. People have a tendency to let their IQ become a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
For example, someone with a lower IQ might think that this means that they can't excel in life, and so they don't even try. Resist the temptation to focus only on that one number. To be effective, intelligence tests should be used in conjunction with other information, such as developmental history, medical background, school performance, social competency, and family experience. Whoops, sorry. Over time, many psychologists have come to argue that intelligence isn't just a single trait. Several have proposed multiple types of intelligence. One of these psychologists was Robert Sternberg. Sternberg proposed that intelligence comes in three main forms, analytical, creative, and practical. Analytical intelligence is the type of intelligence that we associate with doing well in school. It involves the ability to analyze, judge, evaluate, compare, and contrast. It's sometimes referred to as book smarts. Creative intelligence is, well, creativity. It's the ability to conceptualize things in new and different ways to create, design, invent, and imagine. Practical intelligence is sometimes called street smarts. People high in practical intelligence have excellent social skills and good common sense. Even if someone isn't good at school, they might become successful managers, entrepreneurs, or politicians because they're so good at putting things into practice and getting things done. Unfortunately, too many children become convinced that they are dumb if analytical intelligence isn't their personal strength. I'm here to tell you that your grades are not the sole measure of your intelligence or your potential. Howard Gardner loved this idea of multiple intelligence, and man oh man, he ran with it. He said that IQ tests measure verbal, math, and spatial aspects of intelligence, but they were still overlooking other abilities. Gardner proposed eight intelligence types, verbal, mathematical, spatial, bodily kinesthetic, musical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and naturalist. People who are strong in verbal linguistic skills are able to use words well, both when writing and speaking. These individuals are typically very good at writing papers, memorizing information, and reading. People who are strong in logical mathematical intelligence are good at reasoning, recognizing numbers, and logically analyzing problems. These individuals tend to think conceptually about numbers, relationships, and patterns. My father is like this. He's like a human calculator. If a family member is buying a car, they'll take him along because you can throw the MSRP, the number of months, and other numbers at him, and he can tell you more, you know, he can tell you how much more or less it'll cost you in the long run. It's amazing. He has zero people skills, though. He tried to entertain me with quote unquote cool math tricks when I was four. I was not entertained. Individuals who are high in naturalistic intelligence are more in tune with nature and are often interested in nurturing, exploring the environment, and learning about other species. I am not one of these people. I managed to kill a cactus once. Anyway. People who are strong in spatial intelligence are good at visualizing things. These people are often good with directions as well as uh, maps, charts, videos, and pictures. I don't own a GPS, but if, I see, if I've seen a map of something, then I can usually get where I'm going. Those who have a high bodily kinesthetic intelligence are said to be good at body movements, performing actions, and physical control. People who are strong in this area tend to have excellent hand-eye coordination and dexterity. Think of Olympic gymnasts. By contrast, there's me, who tends to trip over absolutely nothing. Do you ever do that, where you trip? over nothing, and then you look at the ground even though you know full well that nothing tripped you, yeah. Also, one time I poured myself a glass of milk and then walked straight into a wall. So I'm not high in bodily kinesthetic intelligence. <laughs> People who have, who have strong musical intelligence are good at thinking in patterns, rhythms, and sounds. They have a strong appreciation for music and are often good at musical composition and performance. Some people say that Gardner's theory takes the concept of intelligence too far to be useful. Maybe you're good with plants, but that does not necessarily correlate with success in school or the workplace, except in very narrow circumstances. 
So there is still some controversy about whether to consider intelligence just one general ability or as specific abilities or both. Uh, by the way, sorry, uh, those who have strong interpersonal intelligence are good at understanding and interacting with other people. Uh, these individuals are skilled at assessing the emotions and motivations, desires, and intentions of those around them. My mother is fantastic at this, so she's a wonderful compliment to my dad. So the way that he can do math, she can size up a person. Uh, so he runs the numbers and she does the talking. It's great. They're unstoppable. Uh, oh, and finally, individuals who are strong in intrapersonal intelligence are good at being aware of their own emotional states, feelings, and motivations. They tend to enjoy self-reflection and analysis, including daydreaming, exploring relationships, and others, and assessing their personal strengths. Both Sternberg and Gardner had categories within their theories related to social intelligence. Daniel Goleman coined this emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the ability to perceive and accurately express uh, emotions and um, understand emotions and manage emotions in oneself and others. In fact, this idea of an emotional intelligence does seem to be predictive of success. There's a famous experiment involving marshmallows. A young child sits down at the table and the researcher puts a marshmallow in front of them. The researcher tells the child, I need to go do something for a while. You stay here. You can eat this marshmallow now if you want, or if you wait until I get back and don't eat the marshmallow while I'm gone, I'll give you an extra second marshmallow. Deal? The kid says okay and the researcher leaves and they leave for a long time, something like 10 minutes. In the meantime, the kid is sitting there, bored, in front of this marshmallow, trying not to eat it. Some kids eat it up right away. Some try to resist, but eventually give in to temptation. And some kids actually manage to wait until the researcher gets back. They do all sorts of things to manage themselves and their temptation. They close their eyes, they look out the window, they pretend it's a fake plastic marshmallow, and so on. Eventually, their patience pays off and they get two marshmallows. Researchers discovered that when those children, the ones who waited, were grown up, they were noticeably more successful than the people who were unable to delay gratification. They were the people who saved their money instead of spending it on the latest thing, who studied instead of procrastinating, who were patient and thorough instead of trying to cut corners. The ability to manage yourself is a hugely adaptive skill.